thank you all for coming. Uh, it's been really, really warm outside, so hopefully this is cool enough. <laughs> so uh, welcome to the library program called the World War II Massachusetts. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome James L. Power. Uh, he goes by James, so welcome James. Uh, before I just give an introduction, a little uh, housekeeping, if you have uh, your phones, I hope you silence it at this time so everybody can hear the presentation. Uh, if you need restroom, there is one on this floor, three downstairs, and if you need water, there is one here, or there is water bubble outside. So, um, now it's my pleasure to welcome Jim. Uh, Jim is a retired teacher, a local historian and a local author. He has been a long time volunteer at Framingham History Center, where he created popular programs such as Haunted Halloween 2, Trolley 2. Jim's other history press titles include Dedham, Historic and Heroic Tales from the Shire Town. And he also co-authored two books. One is called Framingham Legends and Lore and Murder and Mayhem in Metro West Boston. The book, uh, World War II Massachusetts is <clears throat> a collection of stories that could be read well subtitled The Hidden History of the War in the Bay State. This book is filled with unusual and forgot, uh, forgotten tales of ordinary citizens doing extraordinary uh, jobs to support the war effort. So please join me in welcoming Jim. To the Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go around this way. Yes, uh, I taught elementary school, actually, so I didn't really get to do a lot of this at elementary school. I retired two years ago. Um, I grew up in Dedham. I still have a lot of Dedham connections, but hence the Dedham book. Um, and the history part, I focus more on the story. So tonight, there'll be some background, obviously, about you know the home front in Massachusetts during the war. But I try to focus in on the interesting stories that really reveal the, you know, the humanity of, of the people who were living through this, um, some surprises. Some of my stories might be, if, if you remember, some of you might remember the old uh, comic strip, which Rip, Ripley's Believe It or Not. And so, and I like, when I find these stories and I'm reading them, I go, wow, I can't believe that. And I'm, I'm hoping that people have the same reaction. Um, so, we'll just get right into it. I'm gonna start with a story <clears throat> that will kind of set the tone for the rest of the story. <clears throat> Hold on one moment, let's go water nearby. So, it's Tuesday, December 9th, 1941. It's two days after the Pearl Harbor bombing. Um, the citizens of Massachusetts, they're still in shock. They're trying to you know, figure out how to accept what's happened and how to respond. There's all kinds of changes in the state. There are guards everywhere at bridges, at reservoirs, municipal water supplies, uh, federal buildings. There are rumors swirling all about the state and the country. Um, the recruiting offices are swamped. In fact, um, they had the most recruitments in that week after Pearl Harbor than they had in the previous however many years. Um, so on this Tuesday, December 9th, at 1245 in Boston, the air raid sirens went off. And People started to panic, but people also uh, got into action because they had been training for something like this for actually a year and a half at this point. Um, people were confused. They didn't quite know what was happening. Uh, some workers were let home, let uh, go from like the, the Navy Yard. They were sent home. School children were sent home. People were jamming the streets of Boston. They were traffic jams. And at one point, Governor Leverett Saltonstall, the governor of Massachusetts, came on the radio and said that enemy planes were two hours away. And so that's what the situation they were dealing with. Um, about an hour and a half later, they gave the all clear and said that it was a false alarm. There had been a mix up uh, coming from Marshall Field in New York. They weren't, nobody really took the blame for it. Um, but it was, they were not being invaded by enemy planes. However, there was a, a you know, bright side to this. And the bright side was that they did not panic. They had been training, as I said, for uh, civil defense for about a year and a half for such an occasion. And so what they found out was that a lot of people did exactly what they were supposed to do in case of enemy attack. They behaved exactly how they were supposed to behave. And so they kind of spun it in that it was a good practice. 
um, in case they were attacked. But I point out that story at the beginning to show you that <clears throat> all the rest of my talk, all the other stories of the things that happened between that and, and the end of the war in 1945, this is sort of the cloud that people were living under. I think that made it more real for them than Pearl Harbor was when for two hours they believed that their city, um, especially you know, being on the East Coast, being more vulnerable, that they were under attack. And they lived with that fear and that anxiety, but also that willingness to, to jump in and do what needed to be done for the next four years. And so there'll be, just keep that in mind as, as I talk about some of the other things that, uh, that I will, which are, are, some of them are funny, um, some of them are kind of heartbreaking. So I've divided the, the book up into several sections. The first one I call preparation. And the preparation for the war actually started before the war. So beginning in uh, 1939, uh, when the war started in Europe, people were uh, kind of on the fence about whether we should go to war to protect and, and to, you know, to be allies with Britain and France, or whether we would go to war. And it was hard to get a real picture reading the, uh, the polls at the time because it, it changed, it fluctuated. Uh, there were some polls where everyone said, yes, we need to go support Britain. Um, there were other people who thought we should be isolationists. And then there were people who said, there's no way we'll ever go to war. But if they just looked around them, especially starting in 1940, they would see that this was a country that not only was affected by the war in Europe greatly, but was preparing for war. Um, and I highlighted some of those events that would have shown them that, um, that war was inevitable. <clears throat> The first one I have here, April 6th, uh, there were groundbreaking ceremonies at Westover Field. This was a brand new uh, base built out in the Springfield area that was just started from scratch. And this is, you know, uh, well, well before Pearl Harbor. The next one I, I want to point out is um, September 16th. We had the first peacetime draft since the Civil War. And men uh, from ages 21, it was first 21 up to 45, needed to uh, sign up for the draft, and then they would have the, the lottery um, later on in October. And despite that, that they instituted the draft, when war actually came, most of the people who were fighting were actually volunteers. Another important event um, in September was Camp Edwards on Cape Cod. It was expanded, it was greatly expanded. It had existed since World War I, but it was a smaller place. Uh, they leased it to the Army for 99 years, and they expanded it greatly, and it ended up being the largest camp in Massachusetts. Um, then we move into 1941, and we're starting to see civilians who are affected by what's going on in Europe and in Asia. The ones that I've highlighted here, um, August 8th, silk production in the U.S. is halted. Now, there probably was not a lot of silk production in the U.S., but there was some. Um, most of the silk was imported from Japan. And it was really important to the hosiery industry because a woman's silk stockings were really part of her everyday wardrobe and outfit. And, it, and I'll show you in a few slides that it really did cause havoc when uh, the silk, any silk being produced in the United States was diverted towards wartime purposes. And then the other one, um, another military one, is the USS Massachusetts, which is the battleship which you can see now down in Fall River at Battleship Cove. So that was launched at the Quincy Shipyard in September of that year. So let's go back to the draft. Um, this is one of my believe it or not stories. So uh, <clears throat> this is Secretary of War uh, Stimson, and he is pulling, Henry Stimson's in that picture, he's pulling the capsule out with the, the number on it. And so everyone was assigned a number according to their birthday. And he pulled out the lucky number which was uh, number, I can't even read my own writing here. Hold on a second. I think it was number 128. Um, anyway, this guy, Alden C. Flagg Jr. of Acton, what, that was his number. His number came up, so he was number one, just like his father had been in World War I. So just a bizarre coincidence. Um, and, and there'll be coincidences like this throughout the war. But it was sort of the beginning of, um, you know, really unbelievable things happening um, during wartime. Now we get into, so this is the summer of, of 1941. The silk production is, is stopped. Silk imports have been stopped for a while. And this V stands for victory and for vanity is actually from a newspaper ad from the department store Gilchrist's. Many of you remember Gilchrist. 
And it was an ad for their nylon stockings, which they called victory stockings. Now at the time, uh, nylon stockings had been available for about a year. They were fairly new. And women were uh, kind of slow to pick up on the nylon. They preferred the silk. Um, but Gilchrist decided that they would, they would play to women's patriotism. And they wrote an open letter to the women who have been storming hosiery counters across America. Uh, women were hoarding their, nylon, uh, their silk stockings. And in order to promote their nylon stockings, they ran this ad and they said it would be patriotic if you would buy our nylon stockings. Now, the women in the picture below that decided we don't need any stockings at all. And so they are showing off how they are being patriotic and going barelegged. Some of them, I think, had like, crew socks on. And so that was their way to support our country uh, by not wearing any nylons at all, which might have been a little scandalous at the time. Now, the, next, the picture next to that is interesting. These are six youths from Lisbon Falls, Maine. And they have gotten stuck in Massachusetts because they did not realize that there had been a new regulation put into effect. So starting that same week that the uh, silk production ended, gas sales in Massachusetts and several other eastern states were halted between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. And this was on the East Coast. And the reason for that is that one-fifth of the tanker fleet um, was turned over to Britain. And this was the fleet that served the Eastern Coast. So there just wasn't the oil to produce the gasoline. And this is an important picture in my mind because it shows that if you were not cognizant of all the changes and rules and regulations that were constantly changing and being updated, then you might find yourself caught out. And I think of the first days um, of COVID back in March of 2020 when people were saying all different kinds of things, but then the rules kept changing like mm -hmm. day after day after day. And you would um, check either the newspaper or watch the daily news every day to make sure that you were up to date with whatever the regulations were. And it was the same thing, only here it lasted for four years. And there were lots of changes. Some of them were good. Some, some bans and some uh, regulations were eased a little bit. But for the most part, it, for the, especially at the beginning of the war, it was really just, you know, now what kind of restriction do I have now? And, and how do I make sure I don't, you know, either get arrested or fined for breaking that, that restriction? The next section of the book I call reaction and adaptation. So the first reaction that I talked about was that false alarm, where the people actually responded pretty well. Um, but living on the East Coast, it was our fear that we would be attacked by air. Um, it would be from Germany on the East Coast. And so we took some precautions. Uh, one of the first things in March of 1942, the silver dome, a gold dome rather, of the State House in Boston was painted gray, battleship gray, um, because they didn't want it to be a beacon to you know, airplanes that were flying in that would be able to you know, see it and see like moonlight reflecting off of it and then they would be able to find Boston pretty easily and attack. Another thing being along the coast was more for the ships at sea that our lights that were shining from our cities and towns would help U-boats to be able to silhouette merchant ships and be able to sink them pretty easily. And so sky glow was an important thing. And here you see a lovely young lady. And this is from the city of Boston uh, Committee of Public Safety. She's holding a poster that says, sky glow helps the foe. So sky glow was the light, the artificial light that rose vertically into the air. And it was caused by you know, any kind of artificial light source. It could be headlights from a car. It could be lights from a department store or street lights. And She's uh, showing that you know there's a dim out time between dusk and dawn when you had to alter your lights, you had to change your um, your headlights. They, they you could either make or buy special covers that only let like a little rectangle of light come through. Street lights were either covered or every other street light was turned off. And if you lived in this black zone here, which they call the Greater Boston Anti Glare Zone, that was a 12 mile radius uh, out from Boston, then your regulations were even stricter. Now that arrow there is Norwood, which is just a little bit outside of that zone. So Dedham, where I grew up, was a little bit closer, so it had um, stricter rules. And they actually, after the war, when they captured some U-boats and they read their the captain's logs, there were several references to how easy it was to come into the Massachusetts coastline 
Um, one U-boat actually planted mines in Boston Harbor that did not ever detonate, thank goodness. Um, but the captain of that U-boat said that uh, it was so easy to come in because Boston was lit up like it was Christmas Eve. And this was you know, several years into the war. Um, so it was important that we have people who are out there, this is the civil defense people, who are enforcing these rules. There's, a, sometimes people know what a blackout is, and when, and when people talk about, oh, World War II, the blackouts. A dim out was actually what the, um, the area lived under for most of the war. So the dim out was, was what I just described to you, that the, the vertical light had to be reduced. And that was you know, from early on in 1942 till nearly the end of the war. And you would have to look in the newspaper, because they would, even, they would list the, the times of dusk and dawn so you'd know when to do your dim out. A blackout did not happen as often. A blackout was a test that a, lo a local area would do, like a town or a county or a state, to see if they could have as little light as possible, zero light for like a, a short period of time, maybe a few hours. And, but both of those you know, existed throughout the war. One of the other reactions, um, which was uh, you know, something that uh, we look back on and, and um, you know, maybe a little bit of question, but trying to understand how people were thinking at the time, it was the restriction of enemy aliens. So on December 11th, President Roosevelt, uh, rather Germany and Italy declared war on December 11th. And earlier that week, Roosevelt had declared that German, Italian, and Japanese non-citizens were called enemy aliens. And with that declaration, they had some severe restrictions. They had to register at their local post office by February of 42. They had to turn in their cameras, their firearms, their shortwave radios. Their movement was restricted. Um, they had to file if they wanted to leave the town and go visit relatives. There were um, sometimes where there were FBI raids in neighborhoods to find some any aliens. And um, the Italian Americans, who were probably the largest population of these, you know, the three enemy combatants in this area, they were extremely unhappy about this. This is a picture of the uh, Italian fishing fleet in Boston Harbor that was actually grounded at the beginning of the war. I, the fear was that they would be able to bring supplies out to ships at sea and supply them, um, even though, you know, many of these fishermen had lived in the United States for years and their sons were actually fighting in the war. Um, so the Italian Americans were actually able to lobby with some of the Italian American groups to get that restriction lifted in November of 42, but it remained in place for uh, Germany and Japan for the rest of the war. Now, we all have heard about um, rationing and how all the you know, important staples are rationed, some of them because we just couldn't get the supplies or the ingredients. Um, and some of them because we had to divert it towards the military. The first goods to be rationed was sugar. And this was in May of 42. And this required a, a lot of preparation and it, it was a, a very complicated process of people filling out forms. They had to um, fill out questionnaires about who was living in their house, how many people there were, what their ages were, um, and what their sugar consumption was in order to get their sugar ration card. And so in order to facilitate this, they relied on the people who are used to handling um, unruly crowds of, of angry people or, or people who are confused or, or people who need direction, and that was the teachers. So the teachers were the ones who registered the people for their sugar ration cards. They closed the schools across Massachusetts for three days, and People went to the local school and signed up for their sugar card. And they actually did this uh, not that long after for their gas rationing cards. And I, I included this little headline from Taunton, ration book thieves get huge haul at Taunton office. So they, they stole the ration cards. Just to show you that um, you know, not everybody was all you know, gung-ho. Some people were taking advantage, as is, I guess, human nature. And there are other examples of that, of, maybe counterfeit ration cards, uh, people stealing gas, ration, you know, siphoning off gas. Um, you know, I guess if the circumstances allowed it, then people would just take advantage. Not many, but there were some. These are just a few of the other things that were either banned or rationed. 
the fireworks ban, partly because um, you know they, they did not want people producing fireworks during wartime, and there also had been a fire down on the South Shore at one of the fireworks factories. That ban is still in place today in Massachusetts. So most of us know that fireworks are illegal in Mass personal fireworks, and it started during World War II. Um, the bicycle ration each city or town got a quota of the number of bicycles they could have. And, and it didn't seem to make any sense because cities like Quincy that had many, many workers who could pedal to you know, the Quincy shipyard were given you know, a lower number than other cities that didn't have you know, such big industries. Uh, so again, it, sometimes it just didn't seem like the government knew what it was doing and they were trying you know, to figure it out as they went along. This was uh, one of the regulations that didn't really last. And that was that they, they put a ban on sliced bread. And the reason was that the steel in the bread slices needed to be used for war production. And so in, in January of 42, um, or 43 rather, they announced that there would be no more sliced bread. And there were all kinds of ads leading up to this ban uh, telling people how to slice bread because sliced bread had been around since about 1928, which wasn't you know, that much earlier. But it really shows you, you know, that expression, uh, the greatest thing since sliced bread. People love their sliced bread. And people were, were you know, in a panic because they weren't going to be able to get sliced bread. And again, like with the hosiery, there were some, some testy times at some of the bakers who were able to slice their bread. Maybe they had spare slicers um, you know, that they had saved. And so people would hear about a bakery that had sliced bread, and they would all rush down there, and there'd be you know, a near riot. And people were writing letters to the editor in the newspapers saying what a silly ban this was, and it didn't make no sense, and how their lives were inconvenienced by this ban on sliced bread. And so in March of 43, the ban was lifted, and that's when Wonder Bread took out this ad in the Boston Globe, uh, the day that sliced bread was allowed again. And uh, what a joy to not have to slice bread. What a blessing that children may once again help themselves to good bread. Now more than ever on these days of rationing and food shortages, Wonder Bread comes as a godsend. Maybe that's why they call it Wonder Bread. Now another interesting thing, so we have gas being rationed, rubber is rationed, uh, and you know, people are being asked to either you know, carpool or walk, or if they have a bicycle, to take bike or public transportation. And so, Old Dobbin, which was sort of a general name for a horse back in those days, Old Dobbin made a comeback. And there are, I found lots and lots and lots of stories about businesses, uh, newspapers who brought back their fleet of horses and horse-drawn you know, trucks and carriages and carts to either make deliveries or to you know, use, be used as like a cab or taxis. This is actually a song that uh, came out called Hitch Old Dobbin to the Shea again. And you can see in the, this is the sheet music where the guy's broken down and it's he does, can't fix his tire. But if he, were, um, if he and his girl were patriotic, then they would just hop in their, their Shea, which is an old horse-drawn carriage, and they would go off into the moonlight, I guess. Um, this is one example. This is Newton Center. The Part of the problem was um, <clears throat> that since the horses hadn't been around for about 20 or more years. There was still you know, one or two horses here and there, you know, the Ragman or the Iceman. But for the most part, every city and town had restructured not, you know, their traffic uh, flow. They had re repaid their roads for cars. They had taken these uh, horse you know, water fountains that at one time were hooked up to the you know, city water system. They had either disconnected them, some of these Horse troughs were used as planters, or they were just you know, put into storage. So they had to sort of retrofit everything and, and make it good again for the horse, so the horse could have his amenities. Um, and over time, the, the horse phenomenon kind of faded. It became more of a fad. Uh, hay, hay prices rose. And the, um, as I said, like the best shoe for a horse to wear on, on the, the type of road was rubber, and there wasn't any rubber. So it, it wasn't all that practical, but they did find another use for Old Dobbin, oh. <laughs> which was to promote horse meat. Uh, horse meat 
not only was tender and tasty, you didn't need ration points to get your horse meat. Um, it was a lot cheaper than beef, and it was plentiful. You could get it in the form of you know, all these different fabulous steaks. It was government inspected. And when you went to buy it, there'd be no waiting, which <laughs> almost seems unnecessary to write that in the ad. Uh, this is an ad for um, a place in Boston. So for a while, their horse meat and was, I'm not gonna say it was popular. I think the, the government really tried to push it. It just, they said how popular it was in France. And it just never really took off here um, in the States, even though the Harvard Club offered a, a horse meat special. They had a horse meat steak with potatoes and onions. And it was popular for a while. And then people realized, oh, this is horse meat. And not so popular anymore. And again, we had the bad actors. There were people who were passing off horse meat as beef. There were black market horse meat. Um, at one point in the city of Boston, they, they made a regulation that the packaging of horse meat had to be at least an inch high so people could read it and know that they were getting horse meat. They were not allowed to sell brown horse meat because it looked too much like beef. And eventually, Old Dobbin you know, faded away again into history. <clears throat> the next file in my book is called Participation. And I say in the book, and this is true, and this is one of the, what I found one of the most fascinating things about the home front, is that, uh, and I'm not talking about soldiers because that's, that's a whole other subject really, um, although there were 500,000 Massachusetts men and women who served, but the rest of the family who um, didn't serve in the military found other ways from grandma and grandpa all the way down to the kids all the way to the family pet, which I'll explain in a little bit. Um, one of the ways that everybody could participate was by buying war bonds. So these bonds had actually been introduced in April of 1941, so you know, a few months before the war started. They were initially called defense bonds, and you can see in this stamp booklet here, once the war started, they just stamped the word war over the word, word defense. And so little kids could buy them. So this stamp album was the kids could buy them in you know, 10 cents or 25 cent denominations. And then when they filled their book, then they would turn that in and get a bond. You could have the money taken out of your paycheck. You could buy them at banks, or you could buy them at bond centers. You could even buy them at bond rallies, and, and I'll get to those in a few minutes. Those are big, you know, really fun events, um, almost like you know, the 4th of July celebration, where they, they would have entertainers from Hollywood, and raffles, and, and then you could buy your bond. Now, you might recognize the symbol on this poster. That is the Minuteman statue, which stands by the, the bridge in Concord. And it is not a coincidence that um, the man who designed, who came up with this idea, was from Massachusetts. Um, so the Secretary of Treasury, Henry Morgenthau, he knew that um, this was also you know, a war of, of the hearts and minds of the American people to really buy into the war. So this bond program was, was really a propaganda program as well. And propaganda, in, not in a negative sense, but propaganda in a way to, to sort of appeal to people's emotions to get them to do something. And so that's why the symbol was chosen. And the man who chose it was um, named Peter Odegaard, and he was a professor at Amherst College, and he was actually an expert on propaganda. So this, this uh, Minuteman statue was on the bonds themselves. They were on the stamps. They were on the posters. They were in ads in uh, newspapers and magazines. So everyone who saw that statue of the, the Concord Minuteman knew that, that that was a symbol for the war bonds. These are a couple of uh, war bond rallies that I spoke of. The one on the left was on Boston Common. It was sponsored by uh, a radio station, WEEI, I believe that is. And, um, so these girls here were, because maybe their parents bought a bond, they were able to then nail, uh, drive a nail into Hitler's coffin. And you can see the Fuhrer there. Um, his face is etched on their coffin. And having an effigy of Hitler or Mussolini or Hirohito and then burning them or hanging them was quite a popular pastime um, at these bond rallies. There was one that was out in, uh, I believe it was Pittsfield, and they had a picture of the three of them um, you know, stuffed dummies of them, and they called them the three incendiary bombs, and then they lit them on fire. The picture on the right is one of my favorite stories that I uncovered. 
So this is a bond rally in Natick. And, uh, and I, um, I live in Framingham, that's where I taught. So this happened at Natick Common off on 135, where I drive by every day and I just imagine this going on. <coughs> So in September of 1942, they had this bond rally, and it started um, late at night, and it started with a horribles parade. Horribles parades were uh, an old New England tradition where people would dress up and sort of mock current events or, or political themes in parade form. So they had that, they had a band, and they had the three incendiary bombs, Hitler, Hirohito, and Mussolini, hanging from a scaffold on a hay wagon. When they got to the native common, they took them down, they also, they had a, an auction, and they had some celebrities there. They had Joe Cronin, who was the manager of the uh, Boston Red Sox at the time, and they had a couple of radio stars. They auctioned off a uh, baseball signed by Lou Gehrig. And then at midnight, after they played the old jazz tune, I'll be glad when, I'm de when you're dead, you rascal you, then they buried Hitler in a coffin. Now, the tombstone says Adolf Schickelgruber, alias Hitler. And Schickelgruber was a name that was used quite a lot in the newspaper as sort of a mocking insult to Hitler because it was believed that that was his real last name. They believed that his father's last name was Schickelgruber, which it was when his father was born, but his father's um, mother remarried Mr. Hitler, and so Adolf Hitler's real name was Hitler, but you know, fighting a war against Schickelgruber just sounds you know, not as threatening. So, at midnight, they buried Schickelgruber on, this is August 31st, 1942, um, on the Native Common. But he didn't stay buried. A few days later, some local citizens didn't like the idea of having the Fuhrer buried on the Common, so they dug him up. And they brought his coffin and they dumped him in the Waltham dump. And then someone either saw them doing it or saw the, the coffin there. So they took the coffin with Schickelgruber inside and they took it to Boston Common. And they auctioned it off to the highest um, war bond purchaser, which is a woman from the North Shore, and she paid, she bought a $500 war bond, and she got custody of the <laughs> coffin. She wanted to throw it in Boston Harbor and have her own little tea party, uh, but the Coast Guard uh, didn't really like that idea. So she and some pals, they kind of snuck it up to the Fort Point Channel Bridge and tossed it, and it floated out to sea, and that was the end of Shipping River. And um, this is just one of many, many, you know, interesting stories about uh, you know, how people were dealing with, um, you know, their anger and their frustration and, um, and also, you know, raising money for, for the war effort. One of the other things that um, really got everyone involved, especially children, was a scrap drive. So there had been scrap drives before the war. People were always turning in scrap metal and, you know, getting some money for it. But it really, really picked up. Uh, during the war, and with a lot of propaganda. I'll go to the next slide. Your junk will bring it down. To win this war, we need planes, tanks, and guns to build them. Uncle Sam needs your junk. And they would even have posters that would say, you know, like, uh, one you know, old radiator could equal 500 bullets. And so this is something that children really, really got into. And it, they also made a game of it where they were competing. So maybe one school would compete against the other school to see how much junk they could raise or the Boy Scouts would go against another Boy Scout troop. So these two pictures are from the, uh, the Boston Globe. The one in the middle is, is Governor Leverett Saltonstall, and he is, he's got his welder's glove and his mask on, his goggles, and he's blasting Hitler's face prior to them dismantling that decorative iron fence that stood around the State House. And the picture next to it is Governor Tobin, not to be outdone, so he went over to the old Boston City Hall, which is on School Street, the building's still there, and he, you know, took the welder's torch and took it to the iron fence that was around City Hall and ended up setting his shoes on fire. And um, but he still, you know, it was a good photo op. So after the book came out, and I was looking back and just, you know, looking at these stories, and I saw the the headline: Tobin burns himself putting torch to fence. And I said, oh, yeah, I have that story. I'm sorry. And then I read the story. I said, wait a minute, that's a different date. He, he actually burned himself the second time. Um, he set his pants on fire the second time. But, you know, all for, you know, getting, rallying the troops. So let's go back to this picture. Now, I had been told years ago that if you go into a cemetery and you see, you know, like a family plot and it's just granite stones and, and 
it looks like maybe there was an iron fence around it, that they probably scrapped that during World War II. And it seemed reasonable, but I'd never seen it written down anywhere. I, I didn't have proof of it. So I looked and I looked through the newspaper archives, and I finally found uh, you know, primary source proof that this is what was done to this particular fence. So this is the Concord Free Public Library in Concord, Mass. Um, on the left is a postcard from the early 1900s, and you can see that lovely fence that surrounds the grounds there. And on the right is a picture that I took not too long ago of the holes that were left by the fence after they took it down. And I found the article that described how they were going to have a junk rally week in Concord uh, with a parade where they would um, hang Schickel Gruber, of course, and then they would take down this fence and another decorative fence that was around the uh, Minuteman statue, and they would throw it on the scrap heap for the war effort. So if you are anywhere you know, where, where you might see these holes in granite, most likely it's a place where they took that fence down because they, they were, it wasn't scrap drive anymore. It was just anything of iron. And, yeah. and there is, not everyone was on board with this, like I said. Um, and, and sometimes we look back and say, especially because I've read since that a lot of this, the scrap did not really get recycled and did not get turned into bombs and bullets. Um, it was, that again was more of a propaganda. So this, this is two examples of two towns who've had a cannon from old Ironsides. Although I think if, if every town that claims to have had a cannon from old Ironsides were true, old Ironsides would have had about 6,000 cannons, but that's another story. But the one on the left is Dedham. So Dedham donated their old Ironsides cannon. They even wrote a nice message to the Axis from Dedham, and they sent it to the scrap heap and put it in the paper. The one on the right is Walpole, and people were disagreeing about whether they should scrap their Civil War, I mean, rather their Constitution cannon, and their, um, their bell that told when President McKinley died. So I, I contacted the Walpole Historical Society, and I've looked in newspapers. I don't know you know, what happened to this cannon or this bell, whether they still are around. So I'm still researching that one. But again, two different viewpoints. Again, not everybody was like, all right, let's tear down all our beautiful, wonderful iron decorative fences and throw them on the scrap heap. Um, another way to participate was to work either in a, a, a factory producing, producing more materials or producing materials that were sent over to soldiers. And there's lots and lots of examples um, almost every town that had some kind of manufacturing concern, that manufacturer found some way to contribute to the war effort. So the one that I chose to uh, show you was this. This is Assembly Square in um, Somerville. Some of us have been to the mall there. Um, but it was a Ford assembly plant for years. And they made these, um, they were called Bren gun carriers. And it was an armored vehicle that was mostly used by uh, British forces. And the picture, on the top right is them coming off the assembly line in Somerville. The picture on the left is an ad from the Globe where um, showing how they won the Army Navy E for Excellence Award, which is quite an honor. And then if you want to see a real bread gun carry in real life, you can go to the American Heritage Museum in Hudson. If you've never been there, you should go there anyway. They have an amazing collection of um, military, many World War II vehicles, airplanes, tanks, and they have this one on display there. And just, again, one of many, they, they, down in New Bedford, they made uh, barrage balloons, which were balloons that were um, designed to sort of um, get in the way of you know, aerial attack. In, in Framingham, where I live, the Denison Company, which produced paper products and crepe paper you know, decorations, they made these parachutes out of crepe paper that could drop supplies down. So any kind of you know, way that you could sort of retool your company to make things for the war effort. In Haverhill, which was a big shoe company, they made a lot of like cartridge belts and leather things. And this was, again, across the state. And of course, many, many families had um, dads and, and moms and sons and brothers and cousins that were serving. And the way that the people at home would show that would be with a service flag. And you could buy one at downtown Boston um, for 89 cents. You would put a blue star on there for every member of your family who was in the service. If that member was killed, then it would be a gold star. And the companies, the 
manufacturing, and this happens to be the Boston Globe, they would hang a, a larger flag with a blue and a gold star showing the number of their employees that were um, involved in the war effort. And the, the award, though, for an uh, incredible award went to Annie Jordan. She was a widow from Jamaica Plain, and there was a, a story about her in the Globe that I found. And they showed her putting the 10th blue star on a flag for her 10th son, who was actually in the service. Um, my own family, so my, um, my mother's two brothers were both in the service. My father and his three brothers were in the service. At one time, I did have my uncle's um, service flag with the two blue stars on it, but I gave it to my cousin because it was her father. She appreciated that. Um, some of you might have a service flag somewhere in your attic or in your belongings. Now, this, again, was, I, I keep saying everything was the most fascinating. This might well be. The Dogs for Defense program. This was the brainchild of Harry I. Caesar. He was a businessman, and he started, he was the president of the American Kennel Club. So early on, this is a month after Pearl Harbor, he had an idea to recruit 125,000 dogs from families' homes, from pets. And they would be trained as guard dogs for military bases, for you know, munitions factories, but some of them would also be trained to go overseas to um, you know, use their, their sense of smell to kind of ferret out the enemy. They would be trained at regional training centers by um, expert you know, trainers of dogs, and then they would go off and be trained by army trainer, trainers, and then they would be assigned somewhere. So this was a very successful program. And there's a couple of examples here of two local dogs who served. The dog on, on the left is a dog who happens to be named Sailor. And his owners were these two children from Randolph, Ann and Robert McKenzie. And the story goes that they were listening to the radio and there was an ad came on asking people to send their dogs to the Dogs for Defense program. And they are the ones who actually begged their parents to sign up Sailor because their uncle who was a sailor, was in the service, and they thought that sailor could help him get home faster. Um, and then the other dog is a dog named Bessie. Bessie was from Dedham, and Bessie served as a guard out in, um, in Maryland. She trained in Nebraska and was a guard at a US Coast Guard base in Maryland. Now, the interesting thing about uh, sailor was that sailor <clears throat> did not get a, a cushy you know, guard job somewhere in the state. Sailor went to Burma. So the jungles of Burma, which is where my father was in Burma, but he was, he was not in the jungles and not in the fighting. And Sailor was actually, um, had a, uh, a handler, his name was Rusty Meisner, he was from the Midwest. And Sailor saved Rusty's life more than once by alerting to movement or sound that, that Rusty wasn't aware of in the jungle. And it turned out to be snipers, and Rusty was able to take care of them because Sailor alerted. And this happened on more than one occasion. So towards the end of the war, Rusty's commanding officer wrote to the McKenzie family to ask if Rusty could keep Sailor because they were so attached and saved his life, after all. And the children did not want to give up Sailor. And it became a, a, a bit of a, a local story, or even a, you know, around the, the country. People were really interested in this drama of well, what would happen to Sailor. Uh, there was a man who offered to give the children a brand new Irish setter puppy if Rusty could have Sailor. But they insisted, they wanted him back, and they got Sailor back, and Sailor lived out his days with the McKenzie family. And Bessie, Bessie returned from her service as well, and she was buried in the backyard in Dedham under her favorite blanket when, when she went over the Rainbow Bridge. Now, I think about my own family, who are dog lovers. We had a dog when I was a kid. Um, my niece, her dog was part of her wedding party. You know, had a little bandana that said, best dog. I can't imagine um, the way that people feel about their dogs today, that they would just say, yeah, take my dog, my beloved dog, and send him off to the jungles of Burma, and he may or may not come back. Now, I know it's a whole different time, but to me, this really shows the level of sacrifice that some people were willing to make uh, for the war effort. Um, because there was, again, there was no guarantee that, that their um, dog would return. And, you know, they got plenty of dogs. They had to turn many of the dogs away because they were too nice, they were too friendly. This next section is called Fortification. So even though it's, it's about, my book is about the home front and how people dealt with it, 
I can't, couldn't ignore all of the military installations that we have here in Massachusetts. Many of them existed you know, before the war and some of them were built uh, especially for the war. So this is a list of most of them. The ones in the, in the uh, box on the, on the upper left were all um, camps where soldiers, uh, some of them were intake centers where there was training going on or intake or, or also uh, when they were discharged, they would come through there. Fort Devens, which is where my father went. Most of the soldiers in New England went to Fort Devens after they either were drafted or enlisted. And from there, they would go to training somewhere else in the country. <clears throat> camp Edwards that I mentioned, which is on the Cape. Camp Miles Standish was a brand new camp built from scratch down in Taunton. And this was the, the embarkation point for soldiers who, who would go there and then they would go to Boston and from there would go wherever it was they were heading and also supplies. And Camp Framingham was a small camp. It, it's an interesting story. It's right in the neighborhood where my school was that I taught. And it was built, uh, it was built actually in the 1870s to train uh, national, uh, rather, um, it was uh, called the Massachusetts Volunteer Militia, which we know as the National Guard. And, um, and it had been empty for a while, and then they refurbished it during World War II, but they made it look like a New England village. So they built barracks that looked like houses. And that was in case, again, we were bombed, that the bombers would say, oh, there's a nice, beautiful New England village, we'll leave them alone. And interestingly, after the war, those barracks were still standing, and then they were turned into actual housing, which is still there today, with people living there. So that, that was uh, those. Below that are some manufacturing places, the Watertown Arsenal, which had been around for a century or more. Same with the Springfield Armory. Actually, all of these had been around for quite some time, and they employed lots of uh, civilians who would go in and do the work. On the, the right, we have the South Weymouth Naval Air Station, which was actually uh, set up to patrol for U-boats. It was a blimp station, or a LTA, which means lighter than air. Um, below that, the Naval Air Station uh, up in Squantum, which had been there since World War I. There was a lot of training going on there. I mentioned that Ted Williams, uh, he was trained there. Uh, Joe Kennedy Jr., that's where he uh, enlisted and signed up for his flying program. Westover Field out by the Springfield area. The uh, New Bedford and Boston Harbor were, were well fortified. New Bedford, mostly because it's near the entrance to the Cape Cod Canal. And a lot of these forts had been there since the War of 1812, or the Civil War. So they were fitted out with guns. They had anti-submarine nets and you know, radar, uh, sonar detectors on, on the floor of the harbor. Um, same thing with the Boston Harbor. A lot of the islands, you can still go out and see some of the remnants from the World War II fortifications there. And then we had uh, storage areas, the Hingham Ammo Depot and the Maynard Ammo Depot. Um, both of these were built from scratch. And again, we don't think about the cost to, you know, outside of the you know, people who were either killed or, or wounded during the war, but when they built these brand new bases, they had to you know, get land, and so there were people already living in the land. And the best land for doing this would be farmland, because there were you know, not that many houses, it was relatively flat, and they could come in and just kind of start from scratch. So in um, Maynard, there were actually, um, 139 families were moved off their land. It was over four square miles. And it was in Maynard, Hudson, Stowe, and Sudbury. And these are farmers who had been there for several generations. And even today, they, you know, with some of their descendants, there's still some, you know, some hard feelings about the way they were treated by the military. And um, again, it's hard for us to, to really judge from where we sit today because the, the people, when they were interviewed for the newspaper, of course, said, oh, yes, you know, government, you can take our land, we want to help with the fight. But probably, what else would they say? They don't want to look like they're traitors. Um, but there are you know, repercussions for, for generations in some of these families when their land was taken. Um, so this is the uh, South Weymouth Air Base, and this is the hangar that was there, the one on the bottom. It's the same hangar here. And this is hangar number one, which was over 900 feet long. I don't know if you can see, but at the very bottom, those little shapes all in a row are actually automobiles. So that tells you the size of it. <clears throat> and as I said, these were um, 
we call them blimps, they call them you know, lighter than air ships. And part of the reason they needed this was during the first three weeks of 1942, there were 35 Allied merchant ships that were sunk off the Atlantic, in the Atlantic, off the coast of New England by U-boats. And a lot of that was the sky going issue. So these uh, blimps would patrol. They, they went all the way down to New Jersey, all the way up to Nova Scotia. They never actually engaged the enemy. Um, they did do a lot of rescues of some of these merchant ships that were sunk. The story of the Lark is a pretty fascinating one. So the, the U-boat shells Boston trawler. So this was, uh, the Lark was a fishing vessel out of Boston. And it was in uh, June of 44. And they were attacked by a U-boat. And they actually lived to tell the tale. The whole crew survived and their, their ship's gone, survived as well. But the pictures of the damage done are just incredible. When they got back to Boston Harbor, they found 500 bullet holes in the sails. And um, they were minor celebrities for a little while there. But it, again, something that I never thought about was that it didn't matter like where you were, what you were doing. You never knew um, what might come at you. You know, this is sort of close to the end of the war. Um, they're out there not bothering anyone, and but you know, to a German U-boat, you know, an enemy ship is an enemy ship. Um, one of the more interesting stories to come out of these uh, military fortifications is the story of Kilroy. And uh, most of us know what Kilroy is. Kilroy, today we'd call it a meme, I guess. But it was a piece of graffiti that said Kilroy was here, You sometimes accompanied by this drawing of this, uh, this long-nosed guy looking over a fence. And it was towards the end of the war in Europe that it started appearing everywhere on like, fences, on bombed out buildings, on the, on the sides of tanks and other military equipment. And eventually uh, it picked up here in the States, even after the war ended, um, there were a couple of Kilroy songs, like jazz tunes, like Kilroy was here. There was a movie called Kilroy was here. People were using the expression, writing it all over you know, their notebooks. Kids in school would, would say, you know, where's your homework, Johnny? And say, oh, Kilroy took it. And it became a nationwide phenomenon. And um, you know, not surprisingly, people were wondering, well, how did this start? Who's Kilroy and where did this come from? So in um, November 45, after the war, there was a man who said, all right, uh, I'm Kilroy. His name was Francis Kilroy. He was from Everett, Massachusetts. And he claimed that um, it started when he was in Florida and he was sick. And his friend got shipped over to Italy. And, but Kilroy himself didn't go yet. So his friend missed him. And he started writing, you know, Kilroy's coming. And somehow that turned into Kilroy was here. And so he was the Kilroy. Well, that story didn't really you know, go too far outside of Boston. And then a year later, the Boston Elevated Transit Company had a contest. Uh, and they wanted to find out who Kilroy was. So they had an essay contest. And whoever they deemed had written the best essay to um, prove that they were Kilroy would win a prize. <clears throat> and it was won by James Kilroy of Halifax, Massachusetts. And he worked at the Quincy Shipyard. He started there around uh, Pearl Harbor. And he claimed that after he inspected the rivets, he would write Kilroy was here. And they liked his essay, and so he won the prize, which was this 20-ton uh, 1910 model streetcar that you see in the picture here, which is being loaded on a truck to be brought down to Halifax. Uh, as it turns out, James Kilroy had nine children, so he intended to use this as either extra sleeping quarters or a playroom for his nine children. Um, and Quincy, the city of Quincy, has no doubt who Kilroy is. They go with James Kilroy. They have um, a recent I don't know, it's a shopping center or an area called Kilroy Square. And if you go down there in Quincy Center, you'll see the image of the long-nosed Kilroy guy on the side of the building. It's like a metal sculpture. And at one time, they had like a big Kilroy celebration. <laughs> this is a picture of the Army Depot that I talked about in um, Maynard, Hudson, and Stowe. The picture on the right is a recent picture. So these were 55 concrete ammunition bunkers that were connected by rail lines. And this was the, the um, four square miles where the 139, uh, 39 families were, were um, evicted. And you can go there today. It's now the Assabet River um, Wildlife Refuge. And it was owned by the Army up until the early 2000s. And it's only, you know, within the last 20 years, it's become this wildlife refuge. But you can see the bunkers. The, the paths that you're walking on are actually the, um, the roots of the old rail lines. There were 
POWs kept at most of these camps. German POWs uh, and Italians. And sometimes they were hired out to do different jobs, like at apple pickers. Some of them went to um, cut some lumber after a no-name hurricane came through. And a lot of them tried to escape. They, they didn't like get very far because there was really nowhere to go. And most of them were captured within a few days of their escape. Although one of them managed to uh, elude authorities for a couple of years. He was found down in uh, New York. Uh, down in Miles, Camp Miles Standish, they had Italian prisoners there. They built this grotto to the Virgin Mary, which is on the right. And that is the only thing left from the Camp Miles Standish you know, World War II times. It's now uh, an industrial park. And you can go down there and, and see that the remains of that grotto. Um, they tried to escape too. The, the Italian prisoners got special uh, privileges after Italy surrendered. And they were called uh, co-belligerents. And so after September 43, they were allowed to go off and work. The ones in this picture here, they're called Italian service units, and they're working down at the Boston port. And a lot of them actually met Italian girls. You know, a lot of Italians living in Framingham and down on the South Shore. And they uh, ended up you know, making a love connection and bringing their, their bride back to Italy with them. Um, all right, we're almost through here. This is just uh, very quickly. With all this, these um, you know, people training in Massachusetts, especially the pilots, there were going to be accidents. There were over 100 military personnel killed in airplane crashes in Massachusetts during the war. And this is one in particular that I was driving by all the time and didn't know what it was. This is, um, it's, it's on the Needham, Natick, Dover line, uh, Charles River Street and Grove, if anyone knows that area. And there were two British pl flyers who were actually killed on D-Day and they were flying out of Squantum on a training run. And their plane, there were two planes, their plane had engine trouble. And there were some you know, local kids who saw the planes and they got excited and started running. And these flyers were waving them off because they knew that they weren't going to make it. And so they actually saved their lives. These, town, these towns and cities here are some of the other locations where there were memorials to flyers who were killed. And many of them have the same story where the flyers steer their plane away from you know crowded mm. suburban or urban areas into like woods or fields so that they could you know not take some civilians with them. But again, as a civilian you just never knew you could just be out you know plowing your field and a plane could crash you know right near you. It was it was that um, kind of unpredictable. Alright, uh, my last story, our second last story is uh, on Victory Japan Day. So Victory Europe Day was pretty exciting. <laughs> But, you know, we still had some work to do. Now, but Victory Japan Day in August of 45, uh, people just went out of their minds with happiness. And if you think back to that story I told you about December 9th, that fear they were living under, and now it's lifted. And not only that, but we beat the bad guys. So there were, million, there were a million people in Boston celebrating. And during that celebration, this young man named, um, hold on, I want to get his name right. Too many notes here. All right, where'd you go? His name's Charlie. All right, there it is. Uh, Charlie Spatara. So he was from East Boston. He went to uh, Boston to sell his newspapers on the common. He went a little bit early to see you know, the celebration. While he was waiting there to sell his newspapers, a young lady walked up to him. She was about 25. She was well-dressed. She was carrying a baby who was also well-dressed. The baby was three or four months old. And she said to Charlie, I have to make a phone call. I'll give you two dollars. Will you just hold my baby for a little bit? He said, sure, I'll hold your baby. Two dollars is two dollars. She walked up into the crowd and never came back. And so Charlie's waiting around, and she doesn't come back. He's got to go sell his newspapers. Um, so he finds some young girls from Dorchester, and he says, will you hold my baby? Um, so they hold the baby for a while. Um, he goes off. He sells his newspapers. He comes back. The girls are still there. They don't know what to do. So they bring the baby to the, the closest police station on Joy Street, and they turn the baby over, and the next day, it's all over the news, he's, he's christened uh, Little Mr. Victory, and it's a mystery, and it, and it goes nationwide, people are wondering, who's Little Mr. Victory? The, they do a search, they take his fingerprints and footprints, they describe the clothing that he's wearing, it's, it's pretty good clothing, he's in good shape, um, and they make a public appeal, and nobody answers, and so several months go by, 
and then the story just drops out of sight. My guess is that he was you know, put into the system or maybe adopted, and at that point, it's really none of our business what happened to Little Mr. Victory. Uh, that's Little Mr. Victory in the picture on the left with one of the nurses from, uh, I think it was the NGH. So uh, many years go by, and on the 60th anniversary of BJ Day, a writer from Boston writes an article about Little Mr. Victory in the Globe. A few weeks later, Charlie Spataro, who's now 76 years old, writes a letter to the Globe. He corrects a few mistakes, um, but basically says, yeah, I would really love to know who Little Mr. Victory is. And that is almost the end of the story. So I it, just find this a fascinating story. Um, I search on the internet, and I, I find the man who wrote that article, and he's got a website, and in it, at the very bottom, he just says one line. He says, next week I will reveal uh, what I found out about Little Mr. Victory. I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. So I find him on Instagram. I send him a, a, a message. I say, I'm writing a book. I love the Little Mr. Victory story. Tell me what happened. So he, he got back to me right away. And he said, eh, that's great. You're writing a book. So am I. And I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> you have to read my book. So I do not know the ending of Little Mr. Victory. But again, one of the really kind of strange things that happened he did tell me that this happened quite frequently during the war, that babies were abandoned. I didn't find any other evidence of that, but I'm still researching that. Um, you know, that could be a whole other talk in and of itself, I suppose. So uh, my final story, as we're just about at 8 o'clock, is, um, is about this house. So I use the newspaper archives to research most of my stories. I, I read a lot of history books to get background, but the you know the particular stories to our area are going to be found in the newspaper. So uh, this happens to be my house in Framingham. It was built in 1917. So I decided, you know, while I was researching this, I'd just type in my address and see if you know there was a cool story about my house. And there was. It wasn't what I expected. This is the story that popped up from uh, 1944. Two Framingham flyers missing in action. So I'll just, I'll, this is April of 1944. But the red part, that's my address, 29 Arthur Street. And it talks about a missing technical sergeant, a radio man on a uh, liberator named Raymond Hickey. So Raymond Hickey lived in my house. He actually grew up in my house. His father was a Framingham policeman. And I said, that's interesting. It sent chills down my spine because I was in the middle of writing this book when I found this out. And um, every time you know, I, I walked through the house, I pictured Raymond and his family in the house. And I researched more. I found out that uh, Raymond was eventually uh, classified as killed in action. And his, his body was returned a few years after the war. Um, I found his grave. And uh, so I'm going to read this uh, ending of my book for you. I think this is a good way to round it out. Um, we talk, you know, I, I talk about how, you know, again, that four years that I mentioned, all this stuff going on, and the Hickey family is, is going through all of this, the rationing, and uh, the war bonds, and, but at the same time, they're worrying about their son. So I wrote, military enthusiasts enjoy touring the fields and forests across the globe where great battles took place. Standing in these spaces helps them imagine the chaos of the fight and the terror of those fighting. One can get a similar experience in Massachusetts, standing on the deck of a battleship, or a destroyer built in Quincy or Boston, praying in a hospital chapel in Framingham, or walking on the crumbling remains of a gun placement in Boston Harbor. The war on the home front, however, was fought by ordinary people in ordinary places. The train stations, the town greens, the city halls, the private homes of the state's 351 cities and towns. Those of us who happen to live in a house built before the war have the privilege of standing in kitchens where beleaguered moms created meals without basic ingredients of milk and sugar, butter and meat, in backyards where victory gardens flourish, in garages where paper and rubber was stored before being hauled to the salvage drive, in living rooms and parlors where moms and dads read the daily newspaper and listened to news reports and presidential addresses on the radio. While working on this book in my Arthur Street home, the Hickey family was never far from my thoughts, as I pictured them struggling with the daily challenges of life during wartime, from the mildly inconvenient 
to the devastatingly tragic. The fact that a young man, barely out of his teens, left this house to serve his country and never returned is a powerful reminder to me of the sacrifice made by him and thousands like him. I am honored to share his story and add it to the annals of American heroes. Thank you all for listening. Uh, I'll, I will take some questions if we have time, and I do have copies of the book and my other books for sale if anyone's interested. And I'm going to take a sip of water. And, and by the way, this is about a third of the book is what I showed you. There's, if I really wanted to do it justice, I have to talk for three hours. There were just so many stories and people that I couldn't cram into one hour talk. Any, in your book, I'm in Bible. Did you have anything from Norwood? I don't have anything from Norwood. I apologize. Um, Can I give you one? What's that? Can I give you one? Sure. I would love to hear your Norwood story. Well, I'm a lifelong Norwood resident. I'm also part of the historical society here. So I'll give you two. One is Norwood, um, when the, the war started, they divided themselves into 12 precincts. And they were, um, you know, <coughs> civil defense type right. things. And each precinct would have a day where they would have a blackout, or they would have a raid, or you know, a, some kind of practice and yeah. stuff. And two of the precincts were headed by women, which was unheard of back then. <clears throat> Another one was my father um, and his three brothers, all four of them, would go into the street. Um, they all served in, in the service. My father was in Iwo Jima, and his other brothers were in the army. But my youngest uncle, Uncle Paul, before he could enlist, they had a, a, what they call an airplane defense. And yep. he and someone would be at the top of the tower in the high school. And oh, they would be on the lookout. Right. For That's my only Norwood place. story that isn't a story. My friend yeah. that I grew up with in Denver, her mother, yeah. Lived in Norwood, grew up there, and she was an, air, uh, an airplane spotter. Right. And that, I do talk about them in the book. They yeah. were, oh, do you? It's, yeah. It was the, uh, the the ground observation corps, is what right. they were called. Right. And you could either be, where did you say they were stationed? At the top? At the top of the high school. The Norwood High School, yeah. which is, huh. the tower was smaller there. It was the original Norwood High School. They had a big tower, and that you could get up there. Right. Um, and they would walk there and, you know, spend the night or whatever and try to spot planes. And he said most of you just smoke cigarettes, because he would tell the story. Right. He sure. said, talk about girls. But, um, but once he turned 18, he enlisted. He was in the Navy. So, yeah, there were there are a lot of people that volunteered for that, yeah. you know, airplane spotting. They they could be Boy Scouts. It was um, run by the American Legion yes. in, in many towns who, yeah. who took control of that. Right. So interesting. Yeah, my friend. And I said, do you have anything? Because I was coming here uh, about your mom. She didn't remember. She knew she was a, a, a spotter. So right. teenagers could do it. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. I when I wrote the book, I said, you know, I, I knew I couldn't cover every city and town. Right. So there's a lot of Dedham because that's where I grew up. Sure. A lot of Framingham, because that's where I live. And then I, I, you know, I would say, all right, a scrap drive. I need to find a really interesting scrap drive story. And the Natick one, I don't think there's a better one than the Shickle Boomer story. So. Yes? <clears throat> where Marina Bay is now, wasn't that a, that was a, a, a Air Force base, wasn't it? Yeah, I, I believe, and I, I didn't go out there. I did go to many <clears throat> of these places. In the back of my book, there's a, um, there's a places you can go and yeah. see. Some of them are museums, and some of them are just sites where they used to be. And I believe that is where the, the Squantum Navy. Okay, I was going to Squantum because if you go down there, it still says Victory the Victory Drive. Yes, it's a road um, called Victory, the main drag. And somebody had said that uh, there was a uh, an air base yeah. to, to guard Boston. Years years ago, I, <coughs> I was still playing hockey. Uh, they had converted one of the old hangars into an ice rink. And that's where we would play. Oh, right, down there? Wow. At 1 o'clock at night. And still had a lot of the squan. Yeah, uh, oh, okay. I was, wondering, I was wondering when you said squan because I didn't quite. Yeah. I knew where it was. I didn't get, but, huh. Interesting. Yeah, that had been an airfield like in the early 1900s. And then at one point they, they built, for, in World War I, they built ships there. And then. <clears throat> wow, okay. And then it was eventually became the, you know, the, the squan. Naval Air Base. Huh. Uh, yes? I was born in Northbury during the war. There was my parents had taken me to a uh, event at, in the Fens. And the plane came over. Uh, 
Yes. That, that's in my book. Oh, it is. Yeah, that was a, a practice drill, and it was uh, the Civilian Air Patrol, which act, you know featured actually a lot of female pilots, which is another way they got involved. There were several of those, but uh, we could find out when you were born, and I could tell you the date of that. Uh, let me see. Yeah, they, they, um, they had different colored papers that, and they would like one, like a pink one was an incendiary bomb, and a green one would have been on an explosive bomb. And the, the people were supposed to leave them where they were um, and point them out to like the, the wardens, and then whoever like pointed out the most would, would get a war bond. And so, but people were <laughs> jumping into the Charles and swimming and grabbing them. Uh, and Boy Scouts were especially enthusiastic about that. Um, so it, I don't know if it really helped. <laughs> but that, that's interesting that, that you remember that. Um, and I, the bomb I got yeah. was blue. That was supposed to be uh, a gas and, and did you keep it for a while? I did. I yeah. In, like I don't remember what chapter I put that in, but it was, um, you know, it's probably under participation because we had the Civil Air Patrol, which was another civilian uh, group that was able to, you know, they, they did patrol. They actually patrolled a lot along the coast, but they ran some of these drills. So let me see if I can find it here. That's very interesting. They, they, someone who actually lived. During something in my book, that's great. Um, page 35, let's see. Um, all right, oh, here we go. Let's see, I talked about plane spotting, which is what we mentioned before. Uh, oh, Boston, this was July of 44. That's when one, there were several of them, but I don't know if that coincides with uh, the one you might be talking about. It's, uh, I wrote that um, citizens had been instructed to leave the bonds where they landed and inform air wardens of the color, quantity, and location of any that were found. But many eager souvenir hunters, apparently you were one of them, uh, kept the brightly colored bonds, including two that fell in the steps of the State House, one that fell in Mayor Tobin's Victory Garden, and several landed on the alumni field at Boston College in the middle of a marching band competition. Um, there were also 35,000 flyers promoting the next war bond drive. Um, it says, Boy Scouts eagerly snatched up the ones to turn them into to see if they could win the $25 bond. Um, so thank you for sharing that. That's, that's great. So, and my uncle was born. He was born in June of 42. Um, and he always told the story. He was born during blackout. All right, any other questions? All right, well, great. Thank, Thank you. We're a great crowd. Thank you for coming. Thank you. And if you're interested in a book, I'll meet you over at the table. <laughs>